Okay, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to use different examples. If you look at what an evaluation study is, there's several forms of text and probably depending on how much detail you want to go, the one set of information would be in this book, which is a textbook by Bobby Mouton, the social science, social research textbook. It's a fairly standard textbook and it's used very often. Then there's the other textbook, which is the detailed specific textbook by Rossi and Freeman. Now, what is happening in here is that the evaluation research is a fairly, it's established in some fields and in other fields it's not established. And it has its challenges whether it's academic research or non academic research. Now, if we go through about what evaluation studies should be, the definition that's used by Bobby Mitton in social research, it tells you that it's research undertaken for the purpose of determining the impact of some social intervention, typically a program at solving a social problem. So you really, in your case, you are looking at the social problem that should be solved by an employee wellness program. But you just don't, don't want to say it's working, it's not going to work. You really want to go much deeper into it. So evaluation study is not just a superficial study that say, we've done it. It's a very, very deep analysis of trying to understand how did this thing go. So fundamentally, it is a mixed methodology type of study. You would use both quantitative and qualitative information, but you want to go deeper into it. If we go through that, your purpose of evaluation study can be many. In some cases, people will challenge whether it's academic research because they would see that this is a consulting job. You're going to go through the process and you just want to see if it works. So I am evaluating to make a judgment call. Is it work? Is it work? What should we continue? What should we do? Whatever. But that is not really academic research. Your academic research comes in if you want to improve the process. So you say, I've got something in place. How can I go around improving it, understanding it, describing it in order to understand, to do something about it? Which would be linked pretty much to your emancipatory research stances that you try to do something with the knowledge in order to change. But even more important, there is the issue that you want to generate knowledge from that. And that's really where the academic research element comes in. You can evaluate many different things. And typically if people say it's evaluated, they would say, okay, we have the following objectives, da, 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 done it or not. But if you do a really intense evaluation study, you need to know what's neat. If you go through that and you try and see, let us now look at this employee wellness program. What was the need? Who has a need there? Is that a need articulated by the company? What did they want to do? Did they cover their butts? Is this a need um, articulated by the employees? Or has anybody bothered to see what the employees want from the employee wellness? program or is there any deep understanding of what is needed from the employee wellness program? Is it a need say from the medical aid? Uh, <laughs> you know, the whole thing is what is this need about? And typically in any kind of social intervention, if you project manage it, you would determine that need. Now if we use an example and we say, let us look at um, the sand rubble, the sand rubble system, this whole thing. What was the need for the sand rubble system? You could look at it, you can articulate that the need was to have roads in place for the 2010 war. You could also articulate and to say, listen, we want to be both, a we want to be able to upgrade our uh, roads continuously. <coughs> you could also 
said that the total program was put in place to ensure that there is a user pay collection of money to go into the specific development of a certain road. You could also say the whole thing was designed to get the management of the road there and nothing in it ever articulated how the money to fund that would come in. Now the moment you start looking at a very, very contested intervention such as a Sandra, it's quite likely that the need aspect was not fully understood. So when you evaluate something, you really need to go deeply into understanding what is the need and making sure that all of those needs were met. And what can be done about it? Because ultimately, we're either going to make a judgment on it or we're going to try and improve it or we try to generate knowledge about how to go about it, to improve it, saying that these needs were not met, something around it, a deep understanding. In your case, you definitely sit with your evaluation, you're sitting with management's perspective of what exactly employee wellness program would be. You're sitting at least with the employee's perspective of what employee wellness program would be. You're sitting with the medical aids and medical support systems. And if you really go into the history of employee wellness programs, they started in companies that ran their own medical systems. A lot of that was to reduce the cost to the medical system. And if you start looking at the literature around it, it's very important that the premise of it is to meet a certain need, to meet a certain need. And if you start looking at it, and you say, okay, we're looking at a professional environment, we're looking at where employees are actually um, working, are professional people, their needs are different. All those needs being met. So understanding the needs is very important. So you could evaluate that. You could also evaluate the process. We're going to go through this in a little bit more detail. You can evaluate how this has been going. Is it going the way it should be going? You can evaluate whether the outcomes that are set is being met. You can evaluate how efficient it is. Yes, we've done everything. But so much money and people have to run that employee wellness system that it's not really worthwhile. Or you could go around and say, what are the underpinnings theoretically? Now, I think what's your research problem going to be? Basically, you're looking at what at the moment? My brain is now confused. <laughs> Just to talk about it briefly. Um, that um, the housing policies, we should not look at it in terms of numbers, but in terms of the transformation, in terms of spatial, socio-economic. Okay, so you really took in there at the intervention as articulated by the housing policy. Now, so housing policy is based on whose understanding of the need? Is it based on the understanding of the need by developers? Who was actually involved in, in saying what, what, what is needed to be done? Is it really looking, and if you're talking about not only needing houses, but also the social, transformatory, what are all those needs? And are they being met? And a deep understanding of what this is about. You can also look at what process is being done. Now, policy on itself ain't going to do much. There's a whole implementation system around implementing the policy. And very often you can say that this policy is intended to be implemented, but the way that the process of implementation is going is not quite the way it's intended. But if we go specifically around what is the theoretical assumptions around the policy, there's a fundamental assumption in there that if we change the policy and it does deal with certain things, this policy will even be implemented and lo and behold, out will come a transformed housing issue. What is it? So, is this true? Has the implementation of it actually done that? So the theoretical assumptions 
that could be around causes if we in, in say HIV awareness programs the theoretical assumption is by making people aware they would take a less risk key approach and you would get lower infection rate. What is the underlying theories that drive the social intervention? Now if you look at employee wellness, the theoretical assumption there could be that dealing with certain aspects around the wellness of employees will reduce to healthier employers with lower medical costs. That's one of the assumptions. And especially if you look at it for medical costs. It's also looking at more productive employees. There's a whole range of theoretical assumptions. And also reduce the absolutely Yes, so this this is that is around the productive. But there are fundamental theories or ideas underlying this around how this intervention should work. Well, would you, for every study, evaluate all five? No. Or would you pick which ones you're going to evaluate? Or some of them. And some you could do a <coughs> detailed need. But if you're really doing it from a research perspective, and especially at the doctoral level, you have to, to look at that. And typically, when you are looking at issues around knowledge generation it's quite which is your masters and your doctor's research you would quite likely that you would be looking at those underlying theoretical assumptions that you want to know is this this study say this is what's going to happen through evaluation which is not multi, does this happen what else could explain what's happening if you want to improve it you want to know what is it that's happening? And it's very interesting to know that in many cases your theoretical model, the underlying person, could be well known. People could say, okay, and one of the reasons is a lot of current deep evaluations going around the HIV AIDS education programs is because they were successful. Now the question, were they successful? because people really wanted them, the need was so important. Were they successful because they were efficiently implemented? Uh, did we just add more and more resources because it must work? So if you now want to say, I want to take the knowledge generated in here and I want to make a framework that would guide dealing with education around a totally different illness. I want to deal with, say, education around um, breast cancer, which is something that's also happened. So you want to say, okay, this is the reality. This is the underlying model. This is how it's worked. Because I want to say that this framework, this theoretical framework, should guide the process. So I now have a theoretical framework that if this is applied in other situations, it would benefit. Um, it would, would guide that that would be knowledge. Okay, so evaluation research really tells you that I cannot look at it through a single lens. There's no ways I can look at the housing policy from the perspective of government. I need to look, especially when you're trying to look at those multiple objectives that you're trying to satisfy, there are many stakeholders with many different views of all of these things. So when I do this form of social inquiry, it has multiple angles, it's multiple sources of evidence, and I have to understand the multiple stakeholders' perspectives in there, because otherwise it's just a very superficial thing. So if you want to do a very superficial uh, Evaluation from one stakeholder's perspective, this is not evaluation research. This is just doing a consulting job and getting paid for it and saying you were good guys. Not really looking at it. The first thing is on the inputs, where all of those resources would be going on. That would be imp imp uh, impacted seriously on by who are the stakeholders. Who's going to provide the inputs, say, in an employee wellness program? That would include the company. But there's significant input that has got to come from other areas as well. Those people don't 
find that there's any need, obviously they're not going to put the input. Now, how is that going to happen? The program, the process, how exactly should this work? We will do this. So many people should be coming actually understanding that. There's many stakeholders involved in a social a program. It's very seldom just one person or one entity delivering it. The way that people that use it, use it is slightly different. The outputs, do they actually deliver the service? But one level higher, remember we were talking about the impact is the outcomes. This whole social intervention program, whatever it is, does it do what we ultimately intend? Do we get a reduced infection rate? Not there's 500 people, that 500 people come to the awareness program. Did we get the impact, the final impact that we want to do? So there's a very level, there's different um, stakeholders, they have different ideas what should be going on, and you really need to get deeper into that. So, when you deal with the needs assessment, and these things are very, very de detailed, um, unpacked in Rossi and Freeman. If you want to look at the needs, typical things that you want to look at is what are the nature, what's the real problem? In fact, you might be putting in a program that is aimed at addressing needs which you don't fully understand. And I think from the housing perspective, that's one of the things that you're saying. You're saying that maybe this housing policy is looking at a specific range of needs and it doesn't really look at all the other needs. Okay. You could also look at what are the characteristics of the population in need? Who needs, who is the, the individual that need? Now, your population in your case you might say, okay, the employee wellness program is needed by the employees. And they might giggle at you. And they might tell you, no, 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 no. The employee wellness program is only needed by the managers that want me to work my ass off. Or it's only needed by the medical aid that wants to save money. So understanding those things and really looking at that. What services do they need? Or are you adding things that they really don't need? You think that's what they needed, and from your perspective, this is what you're going to give them. Okay. How much of this is the service needed? When is the service needed? We, we were looking at a previous uh, project um, earlier that's looking at supporting students to get improved throughput. And you might assume that if I had three people here, students would really be needing this service continuously through the year. But reality tells you that they need it in the beginning of the year, just after the first lot of tests, during the exam, when there, there's certain peak periods, there's a different distribution. When do they need it? Where do they need it? Do they need it for just a short term? Is it a continuous need? How does that need look? Really deeply understanding that. And then, how are you going to go around addressing that need? Would it be that I have this employee wellness program? And I mean, one of my, my favorite things is when they had this whole program sort of in the, in the 90s, early 90s, they had these wonderful programs of making condoms available. I worked at university at that point, they decided they can't put condoms into the girls' hostels. What would the parents think? And that was one of the more progressive universities, in actual fact, one the one that you went to. Um, there's, there was other things, there was this whole thing that at work environment they would have the condoms available at the nurses, okay? And obviously every single employer, employee is going to go through that, say to the nurse, listen, I'm going to have a wild weekend, hand over a few. How is this going to happen? So just by making it available, and of course the favorite thing is if I'm a manager, if I'm executive in the company, I'm going to go down to the nurse and ask her. This is really going to work so much. So, so this whole program, and this is, once again, this was one of the initial programs. If we have condoms available, people will use them. Is it really available to me? It's there in a massive bowl in front of the nurse. All I need to do is as her manager, in fact, as two layers above her in the organization, 
I'm going to walk in there and take a handful and the whole flippin' plant is going to know exactly what I plan to do this weekend. <laughs> so, so very often, so you're looking at the service delivery around it, and this is a very obvious example, but in very many ways that's <coughs> not an obvious issue. These are the approaches. You want to know what is the need typically. You want to look at stakeholders, their own definition. Do they actually see the same? You want to actually have evidence that this need actually exists. Because very often people say, oh, this is the need. I've got the social intervention for that. But they've got actually no evidence that that need exists. It's somebody's pet project. That's what they're going to do. Is it demanded by, say, a social service agency? Do they need it? Now, if you look at the employee wellness program, what is it going to be that you implemented? The moment we just had a serious giggle, sexual harassment in academic instances is really important. And two people were fired last, I think, yesterday. And two more being fired at this. Uh, there's the four people, probably. They don't know, but the, the process is underway. Now, if they say, Okay, and this is the way it was phrased here, um, there is sexual harassment training happening. Now obviously some people don't know how to sexually harass, or say <laughs> what you're talking about here. Or do you think you need training and awareness? What is it that you need the training for? So it's very important to know what help is being asked. In employee wellness programs, you might assume that people need help with, say, depression. Is it really needed? What evidence do you have that that is a requirement in there? And maybe you then have to have evidence that although it is not articulated, and some people say, but this is utterly unnecessary, you then need to unpack the whole thing that making people aware of a depression state is totally unacceptable in many areas. But may they, will they then actually talk to somebody in the company about it? Do you want that record in the company? I certainly don't want to. So, you know, there's, there's many angles in understanding the need. And you have to do multiple methods. You can't just go around and asking people, please give me your need statement as you had in your document. You've got to find out what that is. You may go, you may in fact go through Content analysis of documentation, you may go into focus groups, there's very many ways that you can go around it. And if you do a full um, evaluation study, probably understanding what that need really is and whether that need has been met. Because ultimately your impact would be that you do what you were supposed to be doing. Or did you get the outcome, the final outcomes? If you look at your program theory, remember we said that you know want to know how is this thing supposed to be working? If I do this, this is supposed to be happening. Or something, who should be served? Are you going to talk in your employer wellness? Are you only going to deal with your employees? If you look in the police situation, there's a whole family issue being more and more exposed. Although this was always known that the, the needs around employee wellness in the police families is quite serious. So how are you going to do that? Are you going to serve the police or are you going to serve the families? What is it that you're going to get? Uh, what services should be provided? Because we think that if we provide the following services in employee wellness, it will ultimately get to the outcomes. Uh, how should it be provided? Should the condoms be put into little containers in, in the bathroom where you can get them separately, which work very, very well? Except that some people then went around, if I put it in there, the cleaners will take it. But say, listen, if you want to distribute key uh, condoms, the cleaners is one of your key groupings of people that you want to make this accessible to. These women don't have access these, to buy these things. So if they take the condoms and not the students, for cheap, that's part of your clientele. So understanding that. And then how are you going to deliver it? How should you organize it? 
what you want to do and what resources are necessary. So your underlying theoretical assumptions that make this, is it true? You can look at your impact, your causal theory that you say, if I do this, it will cause that, it will cause that. Okay. You can articulate it. In some cases, it's clearly articulated. We know what the theory is. And in employer wellness program, you will find clearly articulated theories. The actual issue is that you might find more than one theory. And what somebody they would have brought in this employer wellness program that's based on a specific theory that might not hold through in your environment. So you, you need to understand that. And sometimes people, they just think, but this is what's going to happen. If I do this, the following thing should happen. So you might want to elicit and go into and finding out what's the basic theory underlying this. Your service utilization plan. When are people going to need this intervention? Is a theoretical assumption. And the way you should be putting these things together is a theoretical assumption. Now, these things must be absolutely articulated because you're trying to work out if what you intended to do as it happened. Now, just looking at uh, your final outcomes assessment, if you don't know how the theory worked and you find out the outcomes weren't reached, there's no chance that you can work out why the outcomes didn't reach. You need to look at these things. Approaches. Um, if you just have a black box approach, especially the middle one, if you don't know how it's supposed to work, you can't see why it's working or not working. You can just say, oops, it doesn't work. Does that mean I've got to close down the whole thing or do I need to actually go into the theory and understand it a little bit better and adjust it? Maybe say that I'm not actually dealing with the right clientele. I haven't involved the right people in the social and the housing issue. I haven't implemented it correctly. I haven't clearly articulated certain things. What is it that I have to do? So you've got to look at whether those are sensible and it's based a lot on the literature. So if you look at it, you will find literature that say, or you find research that say that if we do this, the following should happen. It doesn't work unless it implemented. Okay? Next thing is around the process. If you want to assess the process, there are a number of things. This is how this is being delivered. Okay. You want to know out if the, the not the long-term objectives. Am I actually communicating to at least ten percent of the employers employees on a weekly basis, or what is whatever your objectives administratively is. Um, are the right people using that? Ah, my theory was that if I put condoms in there, the students will use it and we will reduce the student infection rate. Or is it now people that the cleaners come and use it? Nothing wrong with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but I need, do need to know that in fact, I have to make sure there's enough to make the needs of the students and the, the cleaners. Do people actually use it? And enough of them finish using it. Do they enjoy it or, or do they, are they satisfied with it? Um, are all the processes handled well? And if you're really looking at it, and especially a lot of the improvement processes go around the actual program, how you're doing the process. Although improvement processes obviously needs to go deeper into your theory, most of the more superficial ones would be looking at the process implementation. How can we do it better? And associated with it is the efficiency argument. Is it just working because I'm pushing in more money, more resources, more people? Approaches. Now, it is if you implement something and you really want to evaluate at the end, you make sure that you do those measurements. Of course, if you do an evaluation study afterward, it's then difficult to do process evaluations because you haven't kept records. You don't know how many people have used it. You don't know how many people have asked the right questions. You don't know how many people attempted to get housing and why these things are failing. 
So the moment you want to do a process evaluation, you really want to be able to access archival data, especially if you look at the retrospective evaluation. And if those archival data isn't there, are you going to ask the manager that implemented if it worked? You're going to get some serious bias here. So your proposed issues around that is detailed information. Because you really want to look what they're supposed to do and what they're doing. You go back and you go and talk to any one of our hospitals what they're doing and those matrons and the, the senior nurses will tell you one thing. When you're sitting down in the street or, or actually in the, in the areas, it may not be actually what's happening. So the moment you do process evaluation, you're really struggling with bias, you're really struggling with, with evidence that will tell you how has it actually been done. And I think that whole housing issues, how is it actually done, is going to be very, very important in understanding and unpacking that people think that this has happened, you know, meanwhile back at the ranch, something totally different is happening. You need detailed data to do that and you need unbiased data. <coughs> And you would be looking at a lot of indicators. It might mean that you have to go deep, deep, deep into evidence. Try and work out if you can see if it's been done. So the moment you start looking at your process evaluation, you shouldn't just look at the obvious things that people would keep records of. Because you look at the records of the managers, it will show a beautiful pattern. But when you start unpacking that through other forms of evidence, it might show something totally different. Um, and you want to do participant surveys, you want to do community surveys, you want to do all kinds of things, because everybody else has a different idea about how this is done. If you're looking at your outcomes, your impact, which is now the final thing, if you want to have that, you want to see has it been reached? Now, unless you really understand what the need is, what the regional outcomes that they want, what is it that they wanted to achieve? Unless you know that, it's very difficult to see if it has been reached. You might go in the whole housing thing, you are looking and you are supposing a new set of outcomes. Is this reaching that? And what would be the theoretical reasons? And how would you go around reaching that? Now, you are supposing certain needs. And you're supposing certain outcomes. But was it intended? Or are you now evaluating something against something that was not intended for? And the moment you're doing that, which is perfectly fine, because you're now saying, can we meet other outcomes? You can actually see if it has made those outcomes or not. But typically your outcomes assessment is against something that you intended to do. And then try to see if there are some adverse side effects. Are there some things that you have not intended? There could be not intended very positive outcomes, or there could be not intended very negative outcomes. It could be, it could go either way. And then do some people use it better? Some people get a better response. Once again, the moment you start getting these outcomes, you have to look at the theoretical underpinnings of whole program theory. You would have to look at how the needs are being met. You would look at the processes. So although you can theoretically do five <coughs> separate assessments, these things are very, very interlinked. And you need to understand how they affect each other. Okay, look at impact assessment. There's quite a lot of, lot of issues here. One of the things is around ethics. If you're looking at a social intervention program, can you legitimately go and say, okay, one part of this company is not getting employees well in this program. Let's see how that works so that we can see what the impact is. And there's an ethical issue whether you can't give people service when it's not happening. And the, the whole thing, if you, if you start looking to the whole ethical dilemmas in the medical areas about control groups, about placebo studies, all of those things, it comes around this. So you need to be able to extrapolate 
what is going to happen without that program? And trying to get that, you have to get a variety of sources of evidence because you want to really say what is really happening during the change and will it continue to have this change? Or is that just a temporal effect? So you want to be able to say what's happened with it, what's happened without it. Not only did it reach it, what would it not have reached? For example, I mean, if you say that no matter what I do, um, they would have improved in any case. Would, does that mean that the whole program was then used, necessary, or would things would change, time have just improved it in any case? If you look at efficiency, efficiency is very important, especially when you start looking at operationalizing this as a long-term service. And very often in, in any assessment, that is what's, what's going to be the issue. You want to know if those resources are used efficiently. One, can we afford the amount? Or are we doing things that are totally ridiculous? In our program theory, we assume that we'd have to do something. And in fact, it is wasteful exercise. Next thing is, it's relatively okay compared to what I'm trying to do. So am I putting in sufficient money, firstly? Am I putting in too much money? Or the money that I'm putting in, does it make sense in terms to what I'm trying to achieve? I might be trying to address a problem that is so small, really. How much money is it? Now, good alternative, and that is probably one of the things. If I did it differently, would it have happened differently? And when you do multiple evaluations, when you see how different people have implemented, you want to see if it's another approach. You can start evaluating that. Um, Efficiency things are really a bit of an issue because typically those are based on a cost, a financial basis. But you really need to take a triple bottom line approach looking at the financial issues, the social issues and the environmental issues. And there's a lot of theory on triple bottom line, whether you do a triple bottom line and translate every bottom line into money and combine it which is typically in many of the triple bottom line study in Australia that tends to be one of the ways we translate it into money and then we look at that. Um, you would typically use risk, what's the, so the financial risk associated with a specific social consequence. Um, or are you going to look at them simultaneously and differently to understand them separately. Okay. The old thing is, what's the cost? What's the impact? You really need to be able to look at that. And many assumptions are made when you're starting to deal with your efficiency. You need to state them. Efficient for who? Can I evaluate the cost of a child dying compared to everything else? And once again, if you look at the mother to child transmission programs, uh, where beetroot obviously wasn't efficient, what was the real consequences of not implementing that? And, and that is not easy to put together in financial. I mean, at, at the point that they were dealing with this, one of the statements that was sometimes made, and certainly not in public by anybody now, is that one of the reasons is that the country cannot afford the orphans that will actually happen after the transmission to children hasn't been, been, has been stopped but the parents still die. Now, to what extent do you want to go and back that study? It's got a lot of political and social impacts, uh, consequences, sorry. And those are the... That sounds very complicated. It is, it is complicated, and I think a lot of people that look at evaluation research think that it's very one-dimensional. The, it is a complicated issue. It is very, very linked. But I think the guidelines that Rossi and Freeman has makes it very accessible. It's possible. And it is mixed method. Because you are mixing the collection, data collection processes. Such as a case study research has multiple sources of evidence. You cannot go around doing single surveys and calling this evaluation study. You've got to really go through that and you've got to look at multiple. You're collecting multiple evidence, you're triangulating it. So it's a very, very embedded design.
but it has a lot of benefits and you have to understand how it works and what its strength is. But there's a lot of potential in it. You can go around and make this a straightforward consulting job. Then of course it's not going to meet the academic standards. So whatever you have to do, this evaluation study, the answer shouldn't be, yep, it was great, or no, it was pathetic. It is not academical. That's a consulting job. Okay. Um, oh, we're done, done now. I'm now done with this part, which I don't know how to switch it off. <laughs> but we can then look at my problems then. Does it make sense? <laughs> I need time to sit and read and 